there we were, me and an overly large, gigantic ghost of Queen Victoria. Realizing the extraordinary opportunity afforded me to personally experience a moment alone with this iconic figure from history. This never-to-be-repeated chance meeting with this fascinating, long-dead, era-defining monarch now standing a mere few feet in front of me. I seized the occasion to do what any intelligent, cultured, sophisticated person would do. Your Royal Majestiness! I had to get a picture with you! Let me grab my phone. Hold on! Oh, the telephone! Professor Bell demonstrated his invention to our Royal Majestiness in 1878. Did he now? Where's my blasted phone? Most extraordinary. You speak into a measly rubber tube and converse with another many kilometers apart, as if they were in the same room. Do tell. Yes, he made a long-distance call from London all the way to Westminster. That's an entire two kilometers. And a half! We were quite impressed. I'm sorry, when I said do tell, I didn't mean for you to take me literally. Where is that phone of mine? We were royally peeved the next month, however. We got a bill! Although sneaky surcharges. Sounds like it was taxing. Two pounds, two shillings. We were not amused. You get a lot of mileage out of that we business, don't you? You should trademark it. Ah, here's my phone. That little phone has a camera. It has a camera, Wi-Fi, MP3 player, Bluetooth, web browser, and a GPS navigation system. Oh, and there's also an option if you want to make a phone call. The phone Professor Bell sold us only came with that measly rubber tube. Now lean in a little closer. A lot closer. Is that really the most you can bend? Pounds you're paying for a phone call aren't the pounds you need to be worrying about. Now suck in your cheeks like a fashion model. How? Just face the phone and look like a duck. Gah! I can't work the camera when the phone hijacks the screen. Who's there? I was trying to take a picture. Why are you calling me on my phone? How about because that's actually a phone's a four twin? Jeez, what are you getting a picture of anyway that's so important? Don't tell me. Mac met you at the beach in a bikini, that little hoochie mama. No, listen, are you sitting down? Does it really matter if I'm sitting or standing? I guess not. Actually, I don't know why people even say that. Because what they're about to say is serious? I suppose. So listen, Sylvie, because what I'm about to say is serious. Yeah, I kind of got that already. Now get this. I am standing right next to an oversized ghost of Queen Victoria. The Queen Victoria? No, but now that you put it that way, yes. The Queen Victoria? Of course the Queen Victoria! It's not like there are other Queen Victorias. Why do you keep asking such moronic questions? Listen, Jack the Ripper showed up, straight away abducted Mac and her assistant Dita, and... I know, two Ditas in one day. Unusual! Right! That's what I said! Anyway, then her gargantuousness appeared and the Ripper bounded off like a deranged rabbit in heat, leaving me alone here with the 50-foot specter of the British monarch. So, what's new with you? Quinn, something's happened. Are you sitting down? Oh, now it matters. I guess not. Look, the strangest thing. There's a little creepy doll in my room. Jack the Ripper's little creepy doll? No, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde's little creepy doll. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde are there too? No, you blockhead. Of course Jack the Ripper's little creepy doll. How many other little creepy dolls are there? Not so funny when the shoe's on the other foot, is it? All right, you made your point. What's the creepy doll doing in your room? Right now, it's just laying in a corner. I meant, how did it get into your room? I assume it didn't just knock on the door and ask to be let in. Come on, Quinn, knock it off. You put it here to scare me. Sylvie, how can you think I'd do such a thing? Oh, don't act so innocent. I know your sense of humor. It's not funny. Exactly. No, no, hang on. I promise you, I didn't have anything to do with the creepy doll being in your room. The creepy doll is what Jack the Ripper left behind the night he abducted Nick. So this must be some kind of message he's sending us. The doll is a sign. The Ripper's about to strike again. Shh, shh, shh. Hold on, your higher mightiness. I need to figure this out. What possible reason could there be to explain the doll showing up in your room, Zoe? He apparently intends to take another victim. He's a repeat offender. You understand that's what's meant by serial killer. They do it over and over Excuse and over. Excuse me, madam. I know that. Do you mind? I can't think if you keep interrupting me. Sylvie, there must be some reason the dolls appear to you. Mr. Canterville, will you listen to me for one minute? Huh? What's so urgent, your majesty? I'm sorry, but if I'm offending some royal protocol of yours by ignoring your incessant blathering, then I'm afraid that's just too bad. Sylvie happens to be a dear friend of mine. Quinn, are you still there? Not now, Sylvie. I'm talking to Queen Victoria. 
And her life may be in danger. Quinn, can you hear me? Can you please keep your trap shut for one moment, Sylvie? Is that too much to ask? And she may be in great peril as we speak. Quinn. For Christ's sake, Sylvie. I'm busy right now. One more word and I'll hang up. Quinn. Later, Sylvie. And if anything were to happen to her, Your Majesty, well, I just don't know what I'd do. Hang on, dear chap. Let me deflate my gown and I'll be right down to speak with you. Yes, good. It doesn't seem you grasp how to pull off the little black dress concept anyway. What with that enormously large top you're wearing. Little being the operative... What, what, what do you mean, deflate? I'm afraid my disguise as the Queen Mother's singular purpose was to scare off the Ripper to save you, my dear boy. As such, it has served its purpose well. Disguise? Rather, for you see, I am not the Queen, for I am actually... Inspector E. Everett Eversfield, Constable of the Metropolitan Police Service, late of Scotland Yard. Stand by, allow me to let the air out of this costume, and I shall promptly be right down. Checking. This thing is going bonkers. Watch out! Bank left! Bank left! What does bank mean? I don't know. It's an aviation term. Doesn't it mean turn? What? Turn! Turn! Right! Very well! No, don't turn right! Watch out! You're headed right toward me! Ugh. Maybe I should have just said turn in the first place. Inspector E. Everett Eversfield, at your service. E. Everett Eversfield. What does the E stand for? Some fancy British name, I presume, like Ewan, Earl, Edwine. Emily. It was either being named that or Leslie. My mother wanted to name me after one of her uncles. But instead you were named after one of her aunts? No, I was named after one of her uncles. I just told you that. Uncle Emily won out over Uncle Leslie. Where exactly did I lose you? After you said at your service. You're from Scotland Yard, you say? I was, once upon a time, a constable. Later, among the first to investigate the Jack the Ripper Whitechapel murders case. I've been on the case ever since. That would be ever since 1888. Then do you know by now who Jack the Ripper is? Certainly. But it does no one any good at this point to know the Ripper's identity, I'm afraid. Our foremost priority now is that he be stopped from carrying out his latest diabolical plan. You know about that, then. The plan where he raises all the murderers in hell, launching a worldwide spree of gore, spilling blood and gut, mercilessly massacring the population off the face of the entire Earth? Well, yes, now, having heard myself say that out loud, I can understand why you'd give that some priority, but... Just a little clue as to his identity? Hmm? A tiny clue? Please? My dear fellow, you wish I should scratch your itch of morbid curiosity. Very well. He is one Montague Druitt, an assistant schoolmaster with the unfortunate fate to have madness run in his family. Right smack toward him. Oh, knowing that changes everything now, does it? Hold the press, breaking news! You see what I mean? Things become yesterday's news. No one cares. People from the past become irrelevant. Oh, I don't think that's true at all. Oh? I'll prove it to you. But first, tell me. What is David Hasselhoff up to these days? How is he relevant? Aha! Touché! But you must tell no one, for we haven't yet made the identification official. It's been over a hundred years. What's taking so long? We need confirmation from the chief constable. Well, that doesn't sound like it should take this long. It has to go through the proper channels. First, we sent it to the Associate Assistant Chief Constable. From there, it went to the Assistant Chief Constable, on to the Associate Assistant to the Deputy Chief Constable. I see. Still, it seems rather lame. From there, it had to go to the Assistant Deputy Chief Constable to the Deputy Chief Constable. Does this convoluted bureaucratic merry old England merry-go-round have an ending somewhere? Then it can go to the Chief Constable. So what's the holdup? We can't remember who's the chief constable. It's been a while. Surely someone must remember his name. Everyone just called him chief. It never occurred to us to ask his name. Now, sir, the Ripper won't be fooled twice. Therefore, we've only one chance at apprehending him, and I believe I have discovered a manner with which to do so. A manner which is so good. How good is it? It's so good. It will confine Montague Druitt, Jack the Ripper, to hell for eternity. That sounds like you've given it a lot of thought. Well, let me be the first to wish you success in your endeavor. I will succeed, thank you, now that I have your able help to assist in carrying out the plan. What plan? What able help? Oh, I'm afraid I'd only get in the way. Don't be modest, dear boy. 
I've made a few observations about you in our short time together I think make you the right man for the job. For instance, you're very smug and consider yourself superior to others. Why, you... You're right! How did you know? The haughty and extremely rude manner in which you addressed me, even though you thought I was the Queen of England, suggests the obnoxious, arrogant attitude of a man who thinks he's better than he is. Wait a minute. Yes, it's your disdain for others, your overbearing, prideful way, your deep-rooted, insecure need to prove yourself is what gives you the overconfidence needed to successfully man this mission. Thank you. What else did you observe about me? You were also rudely awakened out of a deep sleep this morning by the receipt of bad news, which perturbed you, then subsequently further exasperated by a rapid sequence of intrusions from an escalating series of unwanted visitors, each causing you distress, each compounding one upon the other, each exacerbating your hindered state of mental impairment, which left you feeble-minded and obfuscated, which in turn promptly culminated in you needing to make a hasty departure from your abode, causing you to dress absent-mindedly while yet debilitated by your deep state of stupor. Astonishing! But how could you know that? Your left sock differs from your right sock. You got all that from my socks? I'd also wager your underpants are inside out. What? Incredible! You're like a veritable Sherlock Holmes. Like? Hey, Sherlock Holmes? Good, sir. Conan Doyle modeled his famous detective character after me. Did I say modeled? He stole it! He's a copycat! I hate the man. A cad. Be that as it may, I always wanted to know the ability to gain information from the most trifling details. How do you do it? Elementary, my dear fellow. Elementary. That's exactly what Sherlock Holmes says. I told you, copycat! 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 Sorry. Now, sir, what I'm about to tell you may sound extraordinary. Are you sitting down? Uh, no. In my journeys, I came across the research of one Professor Wellitzer of the Berlin Museum. That's in Berlin. His expertise? The Mongolian Wars. His discovery? Though today it's just a McDonald's in Chechnya. In the year 1241, a very good year, if... You were a Mongol. It was a monastery in the tiny village of Kilbasa in the Otto Preminger Empire. There, they enjoyed a thriving trade in religious manuscripts, the monks dedicating their lives to the transcription and publication of their holy books. In his research, Professor Wurlitzer uncovered the story of one monk in particular. He called it the curious case of the sacrilegious monk. As you shall now see, his name was Hogarth. You sent for me, Abbot? Yes, Brother Hogarth. Have a seat. Remember last year's production of the Holy Writ? How oh, do I? Very pretty. What with the accompanying illustrations? That was my idea. A nice touch. Well, we need to make a more favorable impression. All that God-ordained smiting and plagues and ravaging and pillaging takes the edge off when it's lavishly illustrated. Ooh, look at these pictures of the Israelites brutally slaughtering the peoples of the nations around them. Pretty! Never mind that. You worked on the sacred text as well, correct? Yes. I was in charge of transcribing the Ten Commandments. You'll find my best work in Exodus 20, verse 5. Best work? We're getting complaints. Complaints? That's why I summoned you. It seems there's a problem with your transcription of the Ten Commandments. I suppose it's possible. I may have misspelled a word or two. It was dark in the transcribing room. Eleven of us sharing one candle. And to be fair, I was copying a Latin translation, and Latin is a rather archaic language, you know. Why an old knowing God would use a language he knows will soon be obsolete to preserve his word is beyond me. But you know what they say, works in mysterious ways. It's not just about a misspelled word or two. You rewrote the entire Ten Commandments. Explain yourself. <laughs> They came off a, a bit preachy. They're directors from God! They're supposed to be preachy! That's the point! They also seemed a wee bit unnecessary. Unnecessary? A wee bit. A wee bit! Do not steal, do not kill, do not commit adultery. I mean, isn't that just about being a decent person? It's not like everybody didn't already know not to do those things. But it seems you replaced them with commandments of your own. I'm quite proud of those. Proud? What? Like this one? 
Thou shalt think first before saying something really stupid. What about this one? Do whatever you want. Just be nice to everyone. They're more succinct and practical, don't you think? And you added an extra day to the Sabbath. What idiot complain about having an extra day off? No, it's not that. It's that you can't just rewrite the Ten Commandments. Well, it's not like they were written in stone. Yes, it's exactly like that. They were written in stone, you jackass. And the punishments, I mean, death by stoning? For having a lobster dinner? I felt there definitely was some wiggle room there. We shipped a lot of copies. Now we have to do them all over again. Do you realize what that will cost? Do you know the price of parchment these days? God will smite us for this, Hogarth. He'll curse us with boils, lesions, hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoidal boils and lesions. We need to avoid his wrath. You have to rewrite every copy and have them on my desk by tomorrow or, or things will get God awful. Literally. Can I just dress in sackcloth and ashes for a few days? You know how miserably that itches. No. What if I self-flagellate myself? No. I promise to keep my whimpering down. No. Copies on my desk by tomorrow morning. For the love of Christ. Ah, now that's the spirit. Now go. You've got a lot of work to do. And let this be a lesson to you. That's what happens when you cut yourself off from society and cloister yourself. It's not good for your mental health. Your thinking goes wonky. Alas, as the hours drew close to dawn, without a stitch of progress made, Hogarth knew he could not accomplish his impossible task. Desperate and in need of help, he got on his knees and prayed a special prayer. Lord, I am on my knees praying a special prayer, for I am desperate and in need of your help. Please listen first as our menu options have changed. Para Espanol, Presimo el Número Dos. If you're praying about a personal affliction, such as sores or boils, press 1. If you're praying about oppression, famine, natural disaster, such as earthquakes, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, landslides, tsunamis or storms, pestilence, or other imminent dangers, catastrophes, or cataclysms, or a hazard affecting you, or someone you know, please contact your local emergency services. Please! All others, please hold. Your prayer is important to us. for your patience. Oh, good. Well, I have a rather persnickety problem, and I was hoping... All lines are still busy. <laughs> Please continue to hold. We value your trusting Yahweh for all your needs. I hate when they fake you out like that. I'm sorry. Please try your prayer again later. Ah, they don't answer your prayer, and then when you complain about it, they say they did it to test you. Well, I'm not buying that excuse for shoddy service anymore! What happened to Hogwarts? Hogarth. As the dawn's rays started to rise on the horizon, out of sheer desperation, Hogarth resorted to his last hope. A forbidden hope. He turned to the fallen demon Beelzebub, begging him to help. It was with Beelzebub he struck a bargain. His soul for the finished copies. For it was either that, or subject the monastic community to the worst case ever of hemorrhoidal lesions. That sounds painful. Especially considering the monks worked sitting down. All very interesting, but what the deuce does this have to do with trapping the Ripper? Oh, blimey, I forgot about that. I went off on a tangent, didn't I? Oh, oh, Emily, you're becoming a doddering old fool you are. I'll make certain not to stray off course again. You know, when sailing ships set on a course, the way they stay on course Can is you to... please keep to the topic? Oh, yes, uh, what was that? Ah, the Ripper. Well, you see, in his haste, it is said Beelzebub unintentionally left behind the Codex Diabolus, a satanic manuscript penned by the devil himself, in which is contained all the knowledge, both known and unknown, of the kingdom of hell, complete with all its spells and incantations. How very Mephistophelian. Look at you, getting all demoniac. Am I the Faust person to do so? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it invoking Mephistopheles. You got a bit spooky there. 
Sorry, but now look, Inspector. You have yet to tell me what any of this has to do with how to trap Jack the Ripper. Oh, you're quite right, quite right. You see, in the Codex Diabolus, there exists an incantation so powerful. How powerful is it? If you stopped interrupting me by doing that, I was about to tell you. Sorry. An incantation so powerful, should it be recited to any living soul, they would be ripped. The sunder from the earthly realm they stand on, and in that very instant cast down to the bowels of hell, there to be bound forevermore. That does seem rather extreme, doesn't it? What reason would anyone have to come up with an incantation that harsh? Sounds like somebody had a bone to pick with someone. So if we were to recite this incantation to the Ripper... He'd be immediately damned to hell for all eternity. It may be our only recourse to stop this menace, this threat to humanity. Precisely. Let's have it then. Give me the codex, and when Jack the Ripper shows up next, I'll take him by surprise and read the incantation to him. That's a great plan. Thank you. And it would work so well if I only had the codex. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't have the codex? Then who does? Why, Hogarth does. Haven't you been listening to my story? But can't you just meet with Hogarth and get the codex yourself? Surely you dead people must have some place to meet up. Some favorite haunt? Hogarth resides in hell. I can't step foot there. It's against my religion. You must go. Me? Go to hell? Well, it's not like I haven't been asked to do that before, but... Uh, well, traveling to hell isn't something on my bucket list. I'm sorry, but I'm not going anywhere. The heat index is... What the f***? You need only to locate Hogarth and bring back the incantation. Please, you can't put that kind of responsibility on me. It's not complicated. How many Hogarths the monk who made a deal with Beazelbud can there be? Actually, I think I serve humanity best by staying put right here on terra firma to run things. I have everything tightly organized, like a well-oiled machine. I have to keep my eyes on every little detail here, no matter how small. I can tell that's true by the smooth way you put on two different socks. That wasn't my fault! I was feeble-minded and obfuscated! You said so! Only you can stop the Ripper. The world is counting on you. Me? A man who puts on mismatched socks? You have that device you've received from your lady friend. With it, you can pop into hell and back- What, this contraption? Sylvie's portal sensor doesn't always make a direct hit. But maybe we could wait and see if she makes any improvements to it first, before doing anything rash. As he left her with his little creepy doll calling card, your Sylvie sure to be the Ripper's next victim. There's not enough time for that. But I would need time to think it there over. There is no time to think. You must act now. I hate making split-second decisions. I'm sorry, but there must be a more reasonable way to get the Ripper. What kind of crazy old policeman shows up out of nowhere expecting others to jump at his command, anyway? Put your hands up, Canada. Well, that answers that. Enforcements? Not at all. And were I to, I wouldn't have called them. Those two detectives are so idiotic. How idiotic are they? Stop that! Look, you have to explain everything to them. They don't believe we're up against Jack the Ripper. They think I'm responsible for the abductions. Please, you must talk to them. Sorry to let you down, old chap. But that is not something I can do for you. They cannot see nor hear me. Just great. It goes to show you really can't get a cop when you need one. I said, hands up, Canterville. You're under arrest for suspicion of murder. Oh, uh, you, you give me no choice. Inspector, I've made my decision. Happy now? Portal sensor, don't fail me. Watch out! He's got a vibrator! Put that vibrator down, Canterville. This? It's not a vibrator. Whatever it is, put your weapon down now or I'll shoot. Don't shoot. Look, it's just a vibrator. <laughs> Where do you think you're going, Canterville? Stop. Step and I'll shoot. I said stop. All right, you forced me. Oh, isn't that just wonderful? Finally, for once in my career, I get a chance to shoot someone, and it's the same day I forget to bring the bullets. I'll shoot him, Jennings! Um, there's something I ought to let you know about your service, you all heard, Detective King. Where did Cannaville go?
Looks like he ran when he saw my pistol. Just flashing it spooks them perps. What a great gun. So what was it you wanted to tell me about it? Uh, just make sure to keep it out of reach of little kids. It's only rated for ages three and up. Mr. Tucci, are we home yet? I don't know, Norval, but I have a deja vu about this place. It's very familiar. There's barely enough room in here for Dieter to breed. <laughs> it's so cramped. Well, Nick, what other fine dimensions did you get us into now? All of you, stop shoving. My back's up against the doorknob. It hurts. And I think I just locked the door with my butt. Wait a minute, wait a minute. My butt didn't lock it. Shh. Let me crack open the door and take a peek outside. Daryl, can you hear me in there? How long does it take to try on three dresses, for God's sake? Yep, we're back. We're in a TJ Maxx dressing room in Portland, Maine. What are we doing here? Obviously, Mac, we're trying to get back to Bunga Bunk Port. Jeez, at least try to look like you're keeping up. I better call Quinn and let him know we're here. Quinn, it's Nick. Just letting you know I found Norval, Mac, and Dieter, and we're back. We're in Portland. We're going to make our way to Bunga Bunk Port. I estimate we'll be there by 1900 hours. See you then. Bye. Oh. It's me, Nick, again. I don't mean it'll take us 1900 hours to get to Bunga Bunga Port. I mean 1900 hours like in military time. Okay? Okay. Bye. Oh. It's me again. Just in case you don't know, 1900 hours means 7 o'clock p.m., all right? See you later. Bye. What did Quinn say? Nothing. His phone's out of order. If you like what you're listening to, or even if you don't, help us get the word out. Subscribe, give us a five-star review, share us with your friends. They'll love you even more for it. Besides, we love being shared. It's kind of kinky. Canterville's Ghost was created and written by Jack West, starring Jack West, Karen Corrado, and Lisa Rudin, a Razzmatazz Radio Theater production, available wherever you get your Razzmatazz.